Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Elliot. I'm a member of the dealing team here at COSEC Kadari Securities. First and foremost, on behalf of CEO Michael Kadari, Senior Vice President Lawrence Parker Brown, and indeed the entire COSEC family, I would like to extend my gratitude for joining us this evening for what will no doubt be a very interesting evening of insight and discussion. A quick note, at the conclusion of this evening's discussion, we'll be handing out a bag. The bag contains a USB, a key ring, a pen, a stress ball, which is very important, particularly this month, <laughs> and most excitingly, our February report, our investment brochure, and our top three stock picks for the year ahead. All guests will also receive a complimentary invitation to the COSEC Lounge, an invite-only event that will feature ASX 300 CEOs and VIPs from the Australian financial sector, held at our lovely office in Chifley Tower, as well as a complimentary edition of the Kadari magazine, available throughout the nation in news agencies this week. I must admit, I'm rather jealous. <laughs> now, on to the presentation. Our keynote speaker for this evening is our Senior Vice President, Lawrence Parker-Brown, and it is my absolute privilege to introduce him. Lawrence was school captain of London's best grammar school, at least according to him, St. Olive's Grammar, was educated at St. Catherine's College at Oxford University, where he studied PPE, philosophy, politics, and economics. At Oxford, he lectured economics, was a committee member of the Oxford Union Debating Chamber, and the Welfare Officer at St. Catherine's JCR. Lawrence has had his market opinions published in Ben & Co and the Kadari Lifestyle magazine, and has appeared as a pundit live on 2UE Radio, Your Money, Your Call, and Sky Business News as recently as two hours ago. So he is a man of many talents. As mentioned, Lawrence is currently the COSEC Senior Vice President, but his job tonight is to give you the best hour of your year. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lawrence Parker Brown. Well, a lovely uh, evening it is. Uh, the, the excitement and the privilege is representing the team, but mostly I want you to enjoy the next hour of your life. Uh, there can be, for some of you, good memories, indifferent memories of being in lecture theatres. I've been here and been there. I want you to view this more as me being your waiter and I'm here to service hopefully a fascinating discussion because all of us will be engaged in the market this year, some more than others. There will be millions of dollars just from this room alone, millions of cents for different accounts, millions of dollars for others that will go into these opportunities but ultimately it's democratic, it's whatever you make of it and in terms of tonight I'll go straight into the first disclaimer, so that you can hit me with your receipt later. The first is that all of this is general advice. Now, what we mean legally by that is I don't. I would love to know all of your situations. I don't know if any of this would suit your specific needs. This is all financial information that is general in nature. The way that you make it relevant to you is with engaging in the team and with the team. The second disclaimer is that ultimately it's not possible in one hour to cover everything. I hope this is really a prism to start the debate and to continue the questions. I mean, top sports people will know that at your start of season meeting, you have a, a tactic, a strategy of what you want to do, but along the journey, whenever you're engaged in the enemy, the battle plan goes out the window, you need to adapt. And that's true of the market, you can't be static. I wish I could tell you what would happen in 2020, but it's a long way away. So let's kick off. We thought the most useful thing at the start of 2018 is to hypothesize what lies ahead, where is there risk, where is there opportunity, and what do those topics look like? I'm gonna finish with what's becoming in financial circles, the JFK assassination of topics. I'll finish with crypto, but I don't wanna lose anyone first. Refreshments will be delivered all the way throughout. And if you see anyone with a pocket square, consider them a surrogate waiter and they will get you a drink. 
It, I think a lot of us at 2018's beginning would have your plans for the year. You'd consider, what will I do differently? Is 2018 the year that we get your first novel out there? I empathize, sympathize with all of the CEOs, the board, the management team of financial services businesses because 2018 sees the Royal Commission. Kenneth Hayne, uh, the QC that's looking after this Royal Commission, has one year to investigate potential malpractice. He has banking, superannuation, and all financial services industries under that remit. As such, if you are a CEO of any listed financial institution in financial services, you've probably got one of the more stressful years of your life. The bill for this, for the government, is $75 million. Each of the top four big banks have allegedly already spent $100 million in meeting legal and compliance sort of uh, uh, targets. Now, they're also looking to spend more on marketing. So if you're in the marketing game and you can put together a good explanation of what's happened, you'll do well this year. The idea, of course, is that this will examine if any malpractice has taken place. One thing to say from the outset is that the Royal Commission won't be issuing fines. It doesn't have that power. What it will be doing is making recommendations. So in terms of a timeline, Hayne needs to get something back by February uh, 2019 as a report, but he has an interim juncture towards the Q4 of this year. What does it mean for us? A lot of investors in Australian equities will hold one or multiples of the banks. We also, with superannuation, are very much invested in, literally and metaphorically, the major banking institutions in this country. Will it be a year of turbulence? Almost certainly. Will it be a year of opportunity? Well, here we go. Here's your first off the cab off the rank. We propose that when you have the chance to pick up something like CBA, the largest bank uh, by market cap in Australia, one of the most powerful institutions in the Southern Hemisphere, if you can do so below $74, my general advice is that's good value. You might even be able to pick it up at cuter prices. But remember, just as we all have the dream of losing 20 kilos, and writing a great first novel, some of those never come to fruition. I speak to many investors that will snaffle CBA at $12. They'll buy it all day long, but I'm afraid $12 isn't on the horizon anytime soon. These financial institutions, even though they will have some uh, challenges with compliance, which will be aired at this juncture, they are extremely well capitalized. And you look at the global story, we see a global reflation and it's normally very supportive of banking institutions. So the general advice, first cab off the rank is maybe talk to anyone that can support you with buying shares. If you can pick up CBA below 74, I think you'll do well in the long run. Now, here we go. It goes to show whenever you're predicting the year ahead, certain topics come in and out of favor. The big talking point last year was the disruption of Amazon. Now, anyone that's ever spent any time in the UK, in the US, to some extent Canada, will have used this ecosystem. For anyone not familiar, the idea of Amazon, uh, when Jeff Bezos looked a little bit like a geography teacher that was ready to sell you some cheap books in the sort of early 90s, he now looks like something that should be in an action movie and he can sell you anything. The Amazon ecosystem is not just about hard copy books, it's very much about digital transactions. Subscription services to stream media, credit, it's a very clever way of getting you to buy things. The algorithms learn that you love JFK and they will get you everything, including mugs, across to you at discount prices. This is now increasingly having the same footprint it has in the UK, in Australia but it's not yet the, fun, the finished article. So the Amazon fear really created opportunity early on that the discretionary sector in Australia, the bricks and mortar retailers struggled. If anyone's looked at Maya recently on the share market or in a real physical store, you can see it's not a happy house. There is trouble in the kingdom of Denmark Maya, or if you follow my Shakespeare reference. He, uh, if you have the misfortune of being a Maya shareholder, you realize if you are paying staff that aren't very happy, if you have low quality stock, you're in a competitive marketplace.
So we've seen the likes of JB Hi-Fi, Green Cross, a lot of these retailers come under selling pressure. And we were happy to say that we got some clients in throughout 2017 off that selling pressure. Now, will Amazon be a big disruptor this year? If you're looking for risk, I think the likes of Maya Super Retail still contain it. If you're looking for an opportunity, here are some ideas. First of all, Amazon allows you to reach more retailers. If you've got your book coming out, self-published, if you're a niche retailer, you can probably reach more households than ever before. So the likes of something like a Kathmandu will probably find that they don't just need to be in uh, big shopping centers, they can increasingly reach you on your smartphone. The other big opportunity uh, for an investor, in our general advice opinion, is to look at stocks that have come under the selling pressure, but that Amazon will not necessarily be all over their territory. So here we go. Any predictions? What do we think is an opportunity? Not Sean? All right. ARB is a business that some of you might be familiar with if you have four-wheel vehicle, four vehicles. It's tightly held by the family, the Brown family, hence ARB. And if you look at the chart here, we feel it's a really competitive business. Amazon are unlikely to be providing you sat navs for uh, Australian retailers anytime soon that are at competitive prices, but they are certainly not going to be providing uh, any sort of services you get in the garage in terms of maintenance of vehicles, in terms of warranties and so forth. So the idea that Amazon can disrupt this space we think is a fallacy. So if you're patient and it reported very well, we think this is a business that could in three, four, ten years time be very exciting. So there you go. Each time we'll look at a, a topic and we'll try and come up with an investment opportunity link. Now, I've been taking a few requests already. One of the topics we wanted to talk about is energy. And for those politically minded, it's one of the minefields that the current government is trying to navigate. Australia exports significant amounts of coal, significant amounts of LNG, and it can do so to sell it at a lower price than it might even import it. All of this is very interesting. We also have in this wonderful country natural resources. We have natural wonders like the Great Barrier Reef, and we have arguments about climate change. All of this needs to be resolved when you've also got big voices in industry saying that they will move production outside of Australia at current cost levels. It is a conundrum. In terms of one of the exciting stock stories, and I believe um, you know, many of you will have considered already, is the idea that China will increasingly look towards renewable sources of energy for its needs moving forward. What's the big story that's captivating attention? Obviously, within the ASX, you've seen Galaxy Resources, Orocobra, to some extent mineral resources and Kidman, all pick up from this lithium story. Now, whenever you have investment opportunities, you have to weigh up risk and return. The return from these businesses has been strong. But the risk lies in the fact that some of these businesses don't have a strong balance sheet. They haven't been around long enough to prove that if there's any disruption to supply from the likes of China, Chile, Abamal in the States, will they still have a viable business model? My general advice would be that lithium is a risky place to be. Another reason it's risky is because there are many ways to produce renewable batteries. There are many technologies out there. One of the technologies that's interested in involves seawater. Now, if you can take seawater and turn a renewable battery out of that, you'll make an awful lot of money. And I will happily uh, you know, support you in any endeavors. I'll be your waiter. So that's something to consider. The other thing to consider, of course, is that lithium is by its very nature abundant on this planet. Anyone ripping a hole out of the ground in any country is likely to find some lithium. In such an event, the supply will kick out to the right. There will be a lot of supply. <laughs> if there's a lot of supply of something in the world, it's not too valuable. If it's rare, it's valuable. So the supply issue is a concern. Through all of this, we had a good old debate. What can we do to help investors ride the renewable energy space? 
If you're concerned about lithium and lithium production, lithium exploration, is there another way to look to tap into the demand for renewable energy? And like, I was a big fan of Poirot, but uh, you know, we've got a few Miss Marples as well. If you're investigating something, it might not just be the mining that's the issue, it's the capacity to have engineering production around it, maintenance, equipment. So, an opportunity to play the space of renewable energy. Our general advice is that Monadelphus is quite an exciting opportunity. Monadelphus supports a lot of these endeavors with manufacturing and maintaining mining services businesses. On a simplistic level, if you're worried about ripping something out of the earth, you can always be the one providing the shovel. These are big contracts, they can be worth a lot of money. Whenever it's government money, you'll find that they can be for a long period of time. So Monadelphus could be the way to play the renewable energy space. Another area within energy is of course Whitehaven Coal. We've seen that business ride up from below a dollar to riding above four. So Whitehaven Coal was another way to look at it, but it's a bit controversial. I've played it safe and wanted to discuss with you Monadelphus in terms of their engineering capacity. We'll throw open uh, at this juncture. So I'm intrigued by your comment about China's moving away from fossil fuels where they have something like 900 coal energy uh, plants to build. It's a, it's, a, it's a great point. Uh, I have a hope flag that we're really looking forward to questions the whole way through. China, I've spent some time in China. Chinese pollution is frightening. I've spent time in Beijing. And then the further out west you go, if anyone knows the geography of China, lots of Western China on a map isn't habitated. So you only have to go maybe 40 kilometers west of Beijing. I've seen visibility of about four yards. <laughs> where the um, it's like being in industrial Lancashire in sort of 1810 or what have you. Happy memories from ever <laughs> some. Uh, you have the fog, the mist, and the pollution all mixing as one. One of the big themes for 2018, we've got Berlusconi deciding he's back in the ring. We've got Xi Jinping and we've got Putin that are available perpetually. Don't worry about, you know, I, I'm here all, you know, here all year, here all lifetime. I think Xi Jinping has that challenge that he probably does want to make an impact in terms of the pollution, but they have to balance, as you say, they have coal that they want to use up, they have steel production and steel mines that will need to use that coal, and they have to balance all this with not making you know, prices rocket. So I think it is an aspirational notion from China to look at renewable energy, and it's also something on a world stage that they can say that they'll be very proud of. So as you say, I think pay lip service to this idea. That's why Whitehaven's a good opportunity. Are there any other questions <laughs> while Lawrence takes a minute? So if, if wind power has fallen by 22%, it's now the cheapest form of energy. Why does it need such things? That's, That's a, a question for Turnbull. <laughs> 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 um, look, the... And forgive me for stepping on toes. Renewable energy in some ways is as contentious as non-renewable energy. There's a lot of money in the coal and the oil and these producers. I'm sure it's getting lobbied very hard against. If it's going to get subsidised, that's necessarily going to eat away at margins for these coal producers, for these oil producers. That's a theory. It's something that I think is quite under-talked about in the political sphere, in the social sphere maybe uh, worth penning a question to your local member and seeing what he has to say. Because I think it's a very good point. Renewable energy is almost definitely the way of the future. At what point does the money of the non-renewable sector no longer become a viable way of deterring that progression forward? Good question. I'm glad Feeling you're better? there. <laughs> I'm glad you're there. Yeah. Quite right. Yeah. No, it's a... <laughs> Panel with your local member. <laughs> yeah, good, uh, when when will it kick in the the end of the subsidies? I think uh, very soon, uh, because there's, you already see that you know the coal lobby uh, and to what extent BHP uh, have sort of tried to have their um, two two cents in all this. I think you know it's lofty aims to look at renewable energy, but it's not viable in terms of output. It's not viable in terms of cost. And you know you've got wonderful, uh, you know, 
era defining uh, states people like Elon Musk getting involved, but can they produce the batteries on demand that will store renewable energy? It's all uh, sadly the case that you have to be pragmatic. And I would imagine that subsidies for uh, some of these, uh, particularly you know, wind where it doesn't look to be producing great output and how, how is it stored, it's probably not the way that society should spend money. You know, e economics is fascinating. Every time you spend a dollar on something, you impact someone's life. Now, if you, for example, reduce speed limits, for example, that means that everyone's slower and that means that some people will be slower to an operation and they will pass. But you might reduce fatalities. We have to consider the economics of supporting an industry that needs a lot of help and if it's fair. Uh, so I, I would agree. I think uh, particularly if there is significant lobbying, Australia could probably see reduced subsidies. And that makes you, you know, yeah, that would impact many a portfolio. I do. I must uh, add at this juncture that if you enjoy anything that's discussed today, it's come from a team. And if it goes wrong, it's because I'm too hot. <laughs> so here we go. Renewable energy, uh, I think it's one of those themes that will be around like acid rain that sort of eventually might get dropped. And there'll be another focus because at, the, at, the, at present, each economy around the world still needs fossil fuel. Australia has some of the cleanest coal. Uh, in the world, and it has coal with ready buyers. So Whitehaven's another opportunity. If you, you know, I've I've been all sort of nice and coy, trying to guess my audience, but I think Whitehaven's undervalued at present. Add it in, add it in. All right. The Australian housing market. Each of us probably on some level has a stake in this. Whether we are owners, whether we are renters, whether we will only invest through equities. When you look at the RBA's policies in Australia, if the whole world is looking to sort of normalize rates and we're at record lows, the challenge for Lowe and all of his buddies at the RBA is are we about to tip Australia into a housing market correction? The evidence seems to be mounting that over the last six months, we're not seeing growth in Australia, sorry, in Sydney house prices, and we're not seeing it across the board. It is now becoming localized to local issues. There's a lot of um, construction that's happening in places like Adelaide that will impact the housing market. The housing market is obviously driven by a number of factors. Some of that is money coming from overseas. Now, technically, you're not meant to be able to buy an Australian property with, for example, Chinese money. But there's always ways that this can be navigated. Uh, there are always different investment vehicles and through um, ancestry and so forth. Were that to dry up, you would see less demand coming into Australia. The big issue, of course, for someone like Xi Jinping is you see capital flight in China. And we'll get to cryptos as well. Were there to be sufficient money pouring out of the country, it impacts everything that that government can achieve. So there's a slight crimp on demand coming from China. The biggest impact in terms of demand side for uh, the domestic market is the capacity to service loans, the availability of loans. We haven't seen for at least 18 months any wages growth. And without wages growth, and also demographically, younger people are probably less and less inclined to be getting into 25-year arrangements. Now. We increasingly talk about an economy where you'll have a portfolio of roles. You'll be a great sportsman, a writer, an Instagram blogger, all at once. And some will come in and out of favor throughout the time. You might be a political lobbyist. You might also be, uh, I don't know, uh, an investor par excellence. And for younger people, that means that there's less likely to be the case that you'll work with the same employer for 20, 30, 40 years. Also with that, Flexibility means geographical, locational flexibility. Your life might now take you to San Francisco, via Melbourne, and all the way back to Manly. In such an environment, again, there's less inclination to be tied to one home, one employer, one partner. Uh, the world's changing. I say that. I, I'm different, but don't worry. So, demand side, <laughs> old fashioned, absolutely. Demand side issues mean that there is a bit of a drying in terms of how much further we can see growth. The other big issue, of course, is supply. There are a number of apartments coming on stream throughout Sydney, which are likely to bring down prices. 
Availability of loans is also a big issue, obviously, with the banking uh, industry for, for at least a year being under the scrutiny of a royal commission. It's less and less likely that big banks are going to be giving big mortgages to dubious borrowers. Now, not to say that that's happened, but uh, you do hear anecdotally that many people are having these liar loans, this idea that they are you know, earning a little bit more than they claim and they're happy to service the mortgage as is understood. But with any increase in those rates, they would find it a little tighter. So the housing market fascinates us all. There's always a winner and a loser when anything changes. Whenever house prices go up, people on the ladder are thrilled. But it needs to be sustainable that new people, new money can come in. Oh, I'm getting some stuff. Oh, no, that's... <laughs> I thought Sean was doing some. No, that's okay. Not a problem at all. Uh, there needs to be e equilibrium. And likewise, were we to see a big correction, the people that will complain the loudest and the longest are people that have leveraged very recently to have their fourth investment property. <laughs> and whoa, <laughs> well, our, our deepest condolences and sympathies go to those people. Someone was in the AFR recently saying he's got 60 properties up in Queensland. And we should really worry for him if those rates go up. <laughs> Poor guy, he might be down to 55. <laughs> it's, it's a real challenge. And uh, you know, if you've got a lot of properties, the concern would be, can you continue to service each mortgage, particularly if the rates increase? Will rates increase is your million dollar question. Now, I think the RBA will be loath to change the cash rate. That's not to say that banks couldn't then change their internal policies. And one big question is how many of these interest only loans will be allowed to continue? At what point do you need to start paying back the principal? So bank policy will impact this. For all of these reasons, I think the housing market is a place to play with a lot of caution. I would look, if you were investing in investment properties, to have real knowledge of the suburb. I'd want to be confident that this is an area on the up, whether that be linked to infrastructure, great schools, trendy cafes, whatever it is that makes that suburb exciting, I would do the research. I would not be leaping into something off the plan based on somewhere I've never seen. Now, with all of this in mind, our question to the great minds of Sydney that are gathered here today is, would we be looking to put money into the housing market? Like I say, do so with caution. And if you would like to do so, there are many other options than just owning an investment property through your own name in one specific location. If you buy an investment property uh, in one street, in one suburb, in one town, there's much more risk than if you were to diversify with other investment properties. And if you can't do that, you know, we can't all put a billion dollars into, for example, Adelaide and Brisbane, you can look at listed properties, listed property trusts. The one that we wanted to flag uh, was in the February report, so uh, you can read all about it. If you would like an investment vehicle to navigate uh, property in Australia, I would argue that right here, right now, one that's quite exciting, I'll come back to the slides, is Stockland. Stockland has a 20 year history and it's recently been close to a level that we would say might be support. Now, nothing in the future is guaranteed, but a level of support is this notion that at the current price level, Stockland could receive buying support. We've been getting clients this general advice and they've acted on it as they so fit, so fit. So look, Stockland is an opportunity for you to get into not just one investment vehicle on your own, but to be across residential, also commercial properties and diversified. What I love about owning shares is if you manage a property, you've got to worry about some students crashing windows, ruining your drive. They might be having all sorts of illicit activity in there. And you've got to pay some management fees to keep it all ticking over. No one wants an email at four in the morning saying that we need a new boiler. The beauty, of course, of investing in something like Stockland is that you have smart people running the business with your interests in mind. So Stockland is a way to maybe play the housing market. And here's the good news. If you're not happy with how Stockland are doing, you can exit in two days. Pretty much where you bought it, you would imagine, given that it's you know, a high market cap. 
Whereas you can't do that with your uh, investment property over in DY. I know, I've told my wife. <laughs> she says it's got to go on the market. And we've got to have people in their trainers walking around and staring through your photos. And it will take you weeks, months, sometimes longer. So the beauty of being in shares to play the property market is that you get a lot of choice, you can settle so much faster, and you have diversification you wouldn't otherwise consider. All in all, uh, again, not a, not a stock like A2 that's gonna shoot the lights out, but I think Stockland's well worth an intelligent perusal. Well, let's have a look at those slides. Hours of effort went into this, let's have a look at them. Historical highs. And debt. debt's a big issue in Australia. Um, the government on a global scale in Australia doesn't hold as much debt as many other economies, but we hold it as individuals. So we've got bravery and, and so forth, good uh, Anzac spirit. But obviously at some point, and the Royal Commission might lead us to ask more questions, we have to ask how much debt each household can suffice with and maintain racing through. Now the Commonwealth Games uh, could be something that many of you will consider visiting. Some of you might be attending. My uh, capacity to run the 1500 looks like it's been questioned over the years, but you never know, might dust it off. The Commonwealth Games will be a great showcase of much that is great about Australia. Uh, the competitive spirit, the, uh, I think there'll be great attendance for a lot of these games, and it's obviously an opportunity and we'll touch on this more geopolitically to really tap into the Commonwealth. I think the UK will be looking longingly towards anyone that can speak English and has once upon a time been tricked into listening to us. So the Commonwealth Games I think will be popular. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is there a way to invest today that could support us for the next six months so that we turn on, watch uh, more gold medals being won by Australia and have a few thousand extra dollars in the back pocket. This is the service we provide. And for $80 plus free drinks, good value. <laughs> so obviously the infrastructure will be a part of it. I think all those contracts have been ascertained. There will be temporary jobs. Obviously one of the big problems of Olympics, Commonwealth Games, World Cups, is that many of the jobs go to international companies and they pay people on a sort of hourly rate. It's sort of shift employment. So it doesn't necessarily benefit all of the local economy. Who, though, will be ferrying thousands upon thousands of extra people in and out of the country? Airlines. And if you're looking for your criteria of what makes a, good, a great business, management teams are always a part of that. Anyone can put together a prospectus and say, we've got a great product. Anyone can get a marketing department to say, don't worry about the debt, we're doing this, we're doing that, and highlight some numbers, because something will be going right. But if you'd like to be a value investor for the long haul, I would argue that you're also backing the management. Because the management are the ones that motivate the team. The management are the ones that have to react to the challenges. The management in anything, sports, business, warfare, are those that navigate the path that's unforeseen at AGMs. If you're looking for a great CEO, we have a few in the room, there's one at the back that's uh, not too shabby. I would say one of the best in Australia right now is Alan Joyce. In terms of his wit, his likability, his ability to lobby government, we saw him at uh, the Sydney FC launch. He's someone that I would watch talk for hours on end. He's Irish, he could be a comedian if he wanted to be, He's apparently a mathematical genius. I'm, I thought he was. He, well, there you go. He's, he's someone that I would put in charge of many an entity. And if you look at his success record with Qantas, he's been faced by industrial action. He's been faced by refitting expensive fleets. There are issues about who can and can't buy Qantas shares. He's done all of this. And if you look at the share price of Qantas over the last three years, it's one of Australia's big success stories. What's the return on capital? I, I, I can't remember Qantas's debt. Yeah, its debt uh, is slightly reduced. And what's interesting is refitting the fleet's expensive. But what they've done very well is not just see themselves as an airline with Jetstar, but also that loyalty program. So they have almost like an annuities type revenue stream with the best businesses in the country. If you could look up what the return on capital is, that would be wonderful. Um, 29% return on equity. Yeah. And the level of debt? 
all, all, all of this can be examined. Sammy? Um, when they want to renew the fleet, obviously that costs a lot of money. Are they sitting on a lot of cash? Yeah, they've got good working cash flow, but it's very expensive. Most planes are leased all around the world. And one of the responsibilities Qantas have is to guarantee that their shareholders have the best deals possible. One thing they did interestingly is they didn't really hedge the oil price so well recently. If oil prices come down, this is a business that's got a great leader. It's got one of the top and most respected brands in the country. It's also got different revenue streams. In 10 years time, Qantas could be the conglomerate that Telstra would like to be, I would argue. They're making some very sensible investments. They appear to have a pretty motivated team. And all in all, you can pick up Australia's you know, most recognized brand on a PE that can get down as low as sort of 9, 10, 11. I look over my shoulder, there you go, just below 10. It's been prepared for me. So it's well below industry standard. Okay, if I had a spare million, I uh, look at Qantas seriously. And I think if you're patient, it's been as high as sort of 650. You can pick it up today. I think you can easily uh, feel that you've made a great investment. Um, how long do you think Alan Joyce will hang around? Is that the million dollar question? Mm. I think he's uh, able to use Qantas as a platform to also push his own, yeah, his, anyway, his own capacity to engage with the nation. I could see him being a, a name we're familiar with in a decade's time, irrelevant of Qantas. His leadership on the same-sex marriage was fascinating. He's a bold guy, and he's got a lot of interesting things to say. So, yeah, look, if, if Alan, Alan Joyce said, you know what, guys, uh, I'd like to run Telstra, I would, uh, I would re-examine how much we like Qantas. Because, you know, you back a management team in, in a lot of endeavors, particularly running a business that's very competitive. So there we go, the, the Commonwealth Games. Uh, we'll be cheering on all the home nation. US tax reform, again, complicated issue. Tax in the US is subject to state permutations and state sort of uh, different stipends. It's also uh, evolved over centuries. And if you're aware of American history, the right of states is quite important. On a federal level, tax is not simple. Uh, apparently, Chinese tax policy can be summed up in about six or seven pages. US tax policy used to run to around 10,000 pages. So quite how anyone navigated it, it became very inequitable. If you were rich and powerful, you would have one deal. If you were smaller as a, you know, a business entity, you'd have a completely different deal. A lot of the logic would be, let's simplify and demystify what's become a very confusing collection of different statutes. Trump claims he's done it, but when you dig a little deeper, there is a long way to go on this. But on a simple level, the notion is huge amounts of uh, US cash has been stored off sh offshore in uh, little sort of safe havens like Luxembourg, like Ireland, they're holding a tremendous amount of US profits. Apple are one of those businesses, it's fascinating, isn't it, that say, we might bring some of it back if you change your tax policy. And that's the way the world has evolved. And the president's more than happy to do so. What could US tax reform mean for the world? Well, first of all, it means that a lot of money will exit places in Europe that have been storing it. It means that US businesses allegedly are gonna pay their staff more and they're gonna employ more. But the proof's in the pudding. A lot of those pay rises have been one-off thousand, two thousand dollar bonuses, which you don't have to commit to, as you can see. It's not like a perpetual salary increase. Big question for Australia, Australian business. We must ask in the Chamber of Commerce, should Australian tax change? Because if we are out of kilter, with an environment driven by the US of low tax, are we disadvantaging our firms? If you ask a CEO, they will say yes. If you ask people that have to balance a budget, they might have a different view. So US tax reform is fascinating. It's not resolved, but it's in its embryonic stages of starting to navigate how not only Congress, but also local states will enact policy. Can we pick an opportunity that could benefit from this? It'd be a bit lazy if we didn't, wouldn't it? There we go. So the tax plan's obviously uh, been announced, but quite if it's gonna take the effect, uh, no one's quite sure. Here's a business that we really like. 
The beauty of having shares held in your own name as opposed to a managed fund is you can navigate what you believe in. Many people do not believe in pokey machines, online gaming, social gaming targeting, uh, targeted at minors. There are many reasons to feel that aristocrat are not exactly you know, the top of, top first taxi off the rank for all the ethical investors. But they are a business with an excellent balance sheet. They have huge growth prospects, particularly with their le recent acquisitions. And in the US, they have favorable legislation. If they are able to corner the gaming in Las Vegas, the gaming on your smartphone, I think Aristocrat is a great business. This is a business, you'll see a few of these that are at record highs. You can pick up Aristocrat for around $24. General advice, I could see Aristocrat being a business that in five years time dominates its field. Not to saying necessarily that you want Aristocrat to dominate everything that your children spend, but uh, you could see it happening. And uh, this is where investing is fascinating. It's like the drinks cabinet of the best bar in town. You don't have to try it all, but at least if you know what's out there, you've got more options. All right. We're, so we're around halfway through. I hope you're having fun. Love the questions, please. You don't worry about the PE ratio for mm. Brilliant question. So PE ratios create great, uh, it's a great talking point. I'll, I'll caveat it in. Please feel that I was told once that Richard Branson has no hesitation asking any question, how simple, how complicated. So for anyone that's not discussed a PE ratio before, I'll throw an analogy at you. And I'll, t I'll tell you what it is first. If you buy shares and the earnings per share are $1 and you buy them for 10, the PE ratio is 10. So in 10 years, your slice of the profit will have been paid off. So obviously if you're buying something on a 20 PE, on that metric, it's more expensive. It's a yardstick, the same as if you were picking a basketball player, I'd wanna know their height. That's not to say a tall player is good. It's not to say a short player is not useful. But it's the sort of thing a, a scout that was looking at high school teams would ask. If you were looking at rugby, you'd look at weight, you'd look at speed. If you were looking at soccer, you'd look at haircuts and which <laughs> Instagram followers they have. It's not to say it's the only metric you care about, but you would ask the question. So a P ratio, as a good friend asks, is, is, is something worth considering? Now let's have a look at the PE. I haven't looked at it today. 28. Now, some of the businesses that we would say are exciting can be even more expensive. A2 Milk has never dropped below 28 in the last year, and the share price is running along. So PE ratios can be high. For your reference, the average PE on the market is around about 14 at the moment, 14, 15, and historically they trade in a range. You know, it can get, when it starts getting 15, 16, it, you know, the general consensus is this is a hot market. So the PE is around double, what you can buy other shares for. You know, we looked at Qantas, which was below 10. So Aristocrat, roughly speaking, on one metric is three times more expensive. But like we talked about, if you're building a great sports franchise, it's all relative. If your earnings grow quickly, it might justify that price. And obviously, the believers in the story feel that the earnings can grow, but brilliant question, and I'm happy to answer any questions at all. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. In regards to aristocrat, what about government legislation? So you've got Nick Xenophon in South Australia in state politics pushing for a banning or reduction in gaming, and you've got the Labor Party uh, in Tasmania pushing that as well. Admittedly, the, the feds may not go down that track because of organisations like clubs and, and the AHA and so on, but government regulation, would that have an impact on aristocrat going forward? Totally agree. And obviously one thing to throw out there is a debate is refreshing because there's always going to be different views. And if you didn't have different views in the market, it'd be impossible. If no one wanted to sell a stock, then it'd be very hard for you to buy it unless they issued more. So there's always a counter argument. And you make a fantastic point, which is domestically, legislation could transpire or at least could be rumored. This is where you navigate the market. Sometimes that's the best time to buy. Sometimes when there is fear, because one thing that's interesting for Aristocrat is they're around the corner in Ride in their head office. They could quite easily say, we don't like the tax system in Australia. We don't like the legislation. We're upping sticks. And they could have a more viable model offshore. You, you, as an investor, if they list internationally, for example, all this is you know, a pipe dream, uh, a sort of a, a theoretical thought exercise. 
But were that to be the case, I think they would benefit. So absolutely, it could suffer from increased scrutiny. The amount of money spent in Australia on pokies is fascinating. Is it a good thing? Is it harmless fun on a Saturday afternoon? Or is it uh, something that the, the state needs to sort of mind people's decision making? It becomes philosophical. I'll leave you, if, if with nothing else, as a thought for today. There are a few things as democratic in the world as a stock market. You are rarely given uh, uh, the mandate to discuss what should happen on a political level on a minute by minute basis. But we as investors can influence society every single day, 10 till four. And you've got the old match out as well. But absolutely, question. Number one, apart from the fact that our son is the lead soccer player in America. Oh, very good. Well, Who's he play for? I'll still listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he's got a great idea. The second thing is, uh, I always get suspicious of high ROE. Mm. And so again, the question comes up, how much debt are these guys got? They're at race stock, they a lot of debt, that's progress. Okay. Yes. And the other thing is, what's the percentage of the businesses international Brilliant question. So I hope I'll always throw it open. First of all, the first immediate question, who's your son play for? I play for the collegiate program. Oh, very good. So he'll be a... Uh, he's in Boston. Very good. Well, very impressive. And I hope an MLS career beckons. Uh, let's throw it open so that everyone's happy with the terminology because um, all connotations of life have specific vocabulary. And you could look at it sometimes as, in our case, professionals trying to befuddle you. Or Stephen Fry made the point with all the vocabulary for poetry, you could look at it as a chance to learn a new world. You know, if you were in uh, sort of an anthropology class, you'd want to learn all the different words that a certain society had for something. So depending on how you look at vocabulary, it could be fun. So let's look at return on equity. The idea is it measures if for every hundred dollars or every million dollars that shareholders put in, what do they get back? But obviously, not only shareholders putting in money influences the return. So as you so rightly point out, high ROE can be heavily linked and sort of muddied and confused by debt because that debt had nothing to do with what the investors put in. So you could have you know, a few investors putting in some money and a huge loan and you could say, my ROE is fantastic. The ROE uh, from Aristocrat is heavily influenced by its debt, particularly also it's been making acquisitions. And that's a reason for certain, a very logical position to take, that you don't want to be a part of something. Because debt is many things. First of all, debt is an ongoing burden that will impact your cash flow. Debt is also likely to become more expensive to service. And it also shows you that the business has some risk that eventually it can't, you know, it can't grow within its own means. That's one view of the debt. Another view of debt at the moment is we're in a low interest rate environment. If you're aggressive and you can expand, it can justify. But yes, debt is sizable and we'll be able to pull up um, for you in our full research reports exactly what that weighting is. The US business is growing by the year. So that's where aristocrat we think could be very attractive in a low tax environment. What's aristocrat's position on Asia? It's not got such a big footprint in Asia. So US and, and domestically is where it's specialized. It's, it's looked, I think, to have some footprint in Macau, um, but it's not necessarily a global business yet. I mean, that's, again, another story. But as we're probably aware, anecdotally, doing business in countries like China is not easy, and it involves committing you know, big legal costs to be born. Superb. So. 2018, what lies ahead? All of us will care about the economy, I'm sure. All of us would love to leave tonight making a few thousand dollars. One way you can do it very quickly is to pick a business that could be acquired. Because you'll typically pay a sizable premium to pick something up. If you want to break a soccer player's contract, you'll pay a, an extensive premium. If you want to buy all of the shares of a business, you'll pay a premium. Now, in a low tax environment from the US, where earnings are spectacular at the moment, there are many US businesses that feel cash rich. And when they feel cash rich, they might look to make acquisitions. We saw recently with Aconex, a domestic business picked up by Oracle, shareholders in one happy afternoon can make 48% on their investment. So if you're looking for acquisition targets, we'll throw a few around. There might be businesses domestically that could be bought out. 
What could be bought out? Well, at the moment, tech stories are quite exciting. Tech stories, if you can provide something that's unique and you could persuade the likes of Facebook, Alphabet, who own Google, or the likes of you know, the apples of this world to pick up your you know, branded product, that could be very exciting because they're cash rich and they'd love to have something that supports their earnings. You also see domestically in Australia, the business will highlight WiseTech. WiseTech is making acquisitions like Aristocrat, trying to benefit from the environment where they feel they can borrow money and pick up other rivals. Because obviously if you dominate your sector, if you have the best product and they're in logistics of shipping and so forth, and if you can pick up rivals so that they never eat into your market share, that could be very supportive. Another thing to consider is anything that's done badly could get picked up. And this is where investing's fun. You saw Certex, a business that's been struggling over the last 24 months, picked up at a premium. So if you've got a poor management team that have piled up the debt and they're having a complete shambles, it could be an opportunity if you're happy for the risk to invest a little bit and see if they're picked up. Vocus leaps to mind as a business that's made acquisitions. It could have assets that exceed what it's currently valued at. In its current form, Vocus is not where I would put $100, $1,000, a $1 million. But it is a business that someone else might turn around. Someone else might want to either strip the assets or pick them up at a discount. There are other businesses as well. There are other businesses in Australia that are struggling. There's even a few retailing empires that Solomon Liu is casting glances at. These businesses that have struggled could be worth looking at in terms of an acquisition target. Let's look at my slides. So M&A uh, mergers and acquisitions could be an exciting area of investing this year. And you've also seen, you know, is it the top of the cycle when you're seeing the likes of the Murdochs and the Low Lowys uh, looking to sell? Do they know something we don't? Who knows? Is it just on a case by case basis? So we've, you know, Ernst and Young have looked at talking to Australian ex executives. Many are looking to make acquisitions this year. Acquisitions are very exciting. You bolt on a, a new or you accentuate the business you hold and in one fell swoop, you pick up all of their staff, all the intellectual property, all of the debt, but hopefully all of the earnings growth. So let's have a little look at our selection. So you'll leave here today having had a few canapes, met some new people, and you'll have 12 opportunities that we'll flag here and three in the little book we'll give you. Wise Tech. So WiseTech have had a little choppy reporting season. It hasn't gone so swimmingly. And the market isn't so happy with some of their recent acquisitions and how that's affected their profit in the short run. But WiseTech work with the logistics of moving items around. They're not necessarily the last two kilometers where you need someone in an Uber. I get Uber Eats every now and again. <laughs> someone that can't read, write properly and doesn't know where I live. They're not involved in that area of distribution. They're involved in the broader logistics and software that shipping companies use to track where everything is and where it's moving. They allegedly have, they would like to tell the market, the best product in the market. And if you look globally, we probably are a society that are looking to move more and more things more and more quickly on a global scale. So in terms of thematics, and this is the idea that there's an overarching story that could be powerful. I think Wise Tech are in a great story. And the business has done very well over the last few years. They're making acquisitions. So they're using their cash right now and borrowing to acquire new strategic alliances. So again, another opportunity that you might come away from. And in two years time, you might say, I made a few dollars thanks to a great Monday night. And if, uh, if so, then uh, I'll have a pint. Again, strong ideas for 2018. Artificial intelligence deserves to be at the top of them. We, and I've just recently, uh, through the miracle of my wife and uh, her own capacity, uh, brought a, a youngster into the world. I worry that we're not necessarily safeguarding it with what we're doing in tech, because the more you tell a computer something, I worry what, what's the logical conclusion? because artificial intelligence will create almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy that the more you tell a computer it can create its own code and it can teach another computer something, where will it logically end? 
it's hard to see where the model runs out of growth from. So AI is the sort of story that will run and hopefully it will not doom us all. But AI is an area where if you wanted to make an investment, I think the most exciting opportunity domestically is Appen, APX. It's had a great reporting season. It's a business that works with the top clients in the world, the likes of Alphabet, which own Google and Facebook. The counter argument, there's always a reason not to do something. The reason not to buy app and shares is what if these main clients don't want to be their client anymore? Well, my counter argument might be that they might not want to be a client. They might want to own the business. So even if app and have some challenges that they can't exist as a single private entity, well, listed entity, but a single entity, I think someone might try and buy them or conjecture, of course, but a business that provides language and artificial intelligence services to the blue chip clients of the world. So a real domestic success story. All right, so we've got the Federal Reserve, Brexit, oh, there you go, a bit of politics. And I think we've got crypto last. What fun we're having. So the Federal Reserve have a few questions to ask themselves. Emergency stimulus measures have been in place for about a decade, and I'm not sure they intended them to last a decade. We have low interest rates in Australia. We have low interest rates in America. The Federal Reserve tell us that things are rosy in America and that they're starting to see signs of inflation creep through. They're starting to see full employment reached. There is some fudging happening because a lot of the jobs that are claimed are part-time or they're underemploying the, the, the employees, which is a real shame. And there is an extent to which I mean, necessity is the mother of invention. If you can't keep on borrowing at current rates, you will tell people don't worry. But the Federal Reserve might be looking to increase rates four times in the US economy, might be. That will have a big impact on all markets, bond markets. Bond yields will come right back up. They're currently US Treasury 2.87, they would get well above three. And if I'm talking boring jargon, then uh, that's what the industry does. I'm happy to explain individually or, um, but might involve everyone that bore some people that know it well. The idea is, you know, there's a risk-free rate. You can, if you're happy to lend to the US government, they should be able to pay you back, surely, shouldn't they? So you can get around 2.8%. As that comes up to three, that will have big impacts for our market and for equities in general. Why take the risk of running a wonderful business? There are wonderful business owners in the room when you can just give the money to the US government and you get three, four, five percent. It will change the game, but it's contingent on that happening. Will the US achieve their goals? Will employment justify it? Will inflation justify it? I propose today, and you can thank me if I'm right, and I'll hide if I'm wrong, I suppose it's being filmed, I don't think we will get four rate rises. I don't think we'll get that 100 basis point move. I think enough along the journey will be rocky enough that Jay Powell will say, okay, maybe next year. In such an event, there is opportunity. Bond proxies in Australia will get sold off with this idea that we're entering into the bear market for bonds. But that's not to say, I don't think even if we start to see rate rises in the US. I don't think we'll see them here. And I don't think we'll see them as quickly as people are anticipating. That's risky to start telling you buy Sydney Airport. And I don't like risk. I'm a very risk averse person. So here you go. Here's an opportunity that I think will do well in any economic environment, particularly a reasonably low interest rate environment as we have here in Australia. Challenger produce annuities. Annuities allow someone to cash out and get a steady guaranteed income in their retirement. I think that's a very enticing product. The product here in Australia is dominated by Challenger. They white label, so they sort of sell their products through around 75% of financial planners domestically. And they're looking at the Japanese market. Japan has an aging population with five times the desire for annuity products. Challenger, as you can see on a chart, is a business that has performed very well over the last few years. If you're patient and you pick it up on any worries or any dips, I think you will thank yourself over the next decade. So we've been nearly an hour. I hope you're having fun. I hope this reminds you of great lectures and hello, sir. Hi.
So, very quick question, uh, just on Challenger. Mm -hmm. Are they also involved in Singapore? Because I think that Singapore actually has the biggest <coughs> problem in the advanced economies in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, with a with a very aging population. They are in very little capacity to do much about it. They are, to my knowledge, absolutely involved. And the other thing that's fascinating about Challenger is they have a funds management business, which is doing extremely well. Now, I'm sure all of you know someone in the wonderful world of sales that tries to bring new money in. It could be to a government body, it could be to a university, it could be to you know, a, a restaurant or similar. Bringing money in is the most important thing you can do. Challenger bring money in in the billions and they do it very well with a small team. So there's a business that I think will do very well, particularly Singapore, Japan, anywhere that has an aging population they are looking to uh, capitalize. Second, please. please, please. So can you tell us something about Jay Powell? Because he's a, he's a new mm -hmm. guy, and Mr. Trump, in his uh, infinite wisdom, has appointed him, so, you know. You will start to hear from him at the back end of the month. Yeah. So Janet Yellen uh, was briefly the federal chair and did very well by, by all sort of uh, popular uh, insight and analysis. Jay Powell is seen as, as you say, a little bit from the left field and is seen as hawkish. Now, the hawkish phrase, again, what does it mean? Why does anyone use it? The idea would be that he sees the economy as healthier than maybe other economists do, and that some of this emergency stimulus is not necessary. We can start to normalize. That's how he's being pigeonholed. Now, he's brand new to the role, and some people are saying he's inexperienced. But as anyone's ever watched any game of sport knows, you've got to give someone a debut at some point, and they might impress you. So. It will be interesting. He's got to navigate uh, a fascinating period of presidency as well, where one tweet, I get about 12 likes if I'm lucky. I make nine of them do it. Uh, <laughs> he gets nine and a half a second. He gets, well, he gets more than that, bless him, he's very popular. All right, where are we? Oh, Brexit, crikey, here we go. A lot will happen in 2018 on a global scale. Politics is, you know, so fascinating to us all. As I mentioned, you know, Berlusconi is trying to go for his 20th crack at leading Italy in their 400th different coalition government over the last week. The UK is entering into the most complicated negotiation uh, in quite some time. It's not like for like at all, and please don't quote me, but I suppose one historical precedent is the US, when a few Confederate states said we don't want to be part of a union. It's a similar type of seismic decision that's about to be embarked on. As anyone that's been married knows, unmarrying is not easy, and there are lots of logistics and contracts associated. And when law evolves, and it's evolved through one entity, deciding that you're going to go back to law before Europe will be very complicated for the UK. It looks like it will be a complete mess. It's entirely possible it won't be allowed to happen in its current form. All of this for my money means that if you're looking to make investments, there will be excessive amounts of rumors and worrying. Henderson's used to be a fund management business in the UK that's merged with Janus Capital. The US is the place to look for funds management. JHG is the stock. I think you can get exposure to the US market based on UK British fears. So this is an opportunity to pick up a business that should do well in a global reflation story, particularly based on the trepidation as how the UK tells Northern Ireland that you're now part of a separate entity and Europe is nothing and there's no border. It will be fascinating, there may be many articles written. It's great to live through great events. Okay, so there's two more. Trump's big offering to the US population were many things. Uh, one would be tax reform, one would be immigration, another would be infrastructure. Let's make America great again. If you've been to the US, a lot of the airports are decaying, a lot of the motorways were built in the 50s and 60s. There is a huge opportunity for the US to have the level of infrastructure that you see in parts of the Middle East, parts of Singapore. That's the argument. And there are businesses that might pick up from that. Likewise, domestically, if we had the right leadership, well, not the right, who's, who am I to make conjecture? I'm not even allowed to vote because I'm a migrant. Uh, it's true. I asked my wife if, <laughs> please let me have some money. Um, <laughs> 
The infrastructure boom that could happen domestically is also fascinating. Australia could borrow at record low rates and connect, you know, whether it be Melbourne to be connected with Sydney, whether it be new airports, there are massive opportunities. Those contracts which are worth millions, often billions, will be won by a narrow set of businesses. Borrell, James Hardy, you're probably familiar with, our pick for 2018, okay, this is no commission, uh, have no influence in it, is Blue Scope. So Blue Scope Steel, a business where we like its growth trajectory, particularly in the States, we think it's undervalued at current levels. Rarely the case in the market where something's a giveaway buy. It's rarely the case that you think it's so cheap, its growth is exciting. I think Blue Scope could have a very strong next few years. All right, so now we're going to go into the hardest questions, please, my friends. At what point do you think that Blue Scope would run out of runway? As, it, as in its production capacity? And it, well, you know, yeah. If it, doesn't, if it fails to launch, you know, if it fails to lift at a certain point, where would you think that that's installed? Yeah, sure. And look, uh, one of the big questions would be what if Trump can't borrow at that level? Uh, one of the fascinating points about Republicans, Democrats, is I saw some people on TV saying, oh, Republicans don't like to borrow money. They love to borrow money. It's just what for? And obviously, we've seen that uh, defense is another place. I haven't listed any defense stocks, but uh, you know that's probably somewhere we'll see some spending in the U.S. Sammy, if uh, the U.S. do hike interest rates up um, a few uh, base points, will that drop our dollar? And if so, will that help Blue Scope? Mm, absolutely. Now our dollar's been on a little run and got to around eighty cents, but I think it could quite conceivably come back down and become weaker. And yes, that would help in terms of winning contracts. Obviously, the way that these companies repatriate the tax will also, you know, depend on domestic policy. But all in all, it should be supportive. All right, so uh, we've got to the last topic. Uh, I've been. Very lucky to talk to you for so long. Uh, here we go. This is the most complicated thing I'll ever talk about. Cryptocurrencies. Complicated because it's a minefield and it's a fun minefield to have an opinion on. The supporters of it, let's look at the strengths, would say no central bank can influence this. It's entirely democratic. It's of the people, by the people. It's all very Lincolnian. It's also potentially got fascinating technology underpinning it. A ledger might exist on a, you know, in a uh, booklet in Italy from 600 years ago, but now ledgers can be simultaneously, instantly changed and distributed to all the remotely held ledgers. Blockchain is very, very clever. So the support for crypto comes from the idea that it's also, because it's so complicated to fraudulently create the code, I mean, it can't really be done as I understand that there is a, some sort of limit on how much can be produced and there is authenticity of how it was generated. It's entirely possible that cryptocurrencies will one day be the way that we all pay for our goods and services. Challenge is, is if someone that likes to buy in cash gifts for the wife, how do I hide it from them? How do I get my extra little you know, presents from different retailers? Well, it's gonna be very difficult. And there is to some extent a war on cash uh, the idea that you could just take $50 and buy anything from anyone at some point might not exist. You know, we might have a digital trail for everything one day. So crypto has been very exciting. It's also very exciting, irrelevant to the technology as an, a speculat speculatory investment vehicle. The naysayers, of course, will say there's huge regulatory risk, which there is. It could be uh, completely outlawed in huge areas of legal jurisdiction. South Korea wants nothing to do with it. I actually watch South Korean cable for reasons that are a bit complicated, but my mother-in-law loves it. And they're always advertising gold, but uh, they've said South Korea, we don't want anything to do with cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are also potentially a huge bubble in the sense that how do you value them? What are they? They have no physical existence. They're as valuable as you think they are. Of course, the counter argument is you could say the same with fiat currencies. I mean, the dollar in your pocket isn't necessarily worth a dollar to make. All in all, we've all, for the last year and a half, when, since it's gone mainstream, had an opinion on these cryptos. It would be a far smarter, wittier, more handsome and less hot individual that could tell you what will happen to Ethereum, Litecoin, Bitcoin over the last 12 months because there's so much that can change. 
it could become the case that people find it a fascinating story and more demand returns. It could be something that dissipates. But I've promised you an investment opportunity for all of the talking points of 2018. If you like the underpinning technology of blockchain, there is a dull as dishwater monopoly, a vanilla stock that boring people like me love, and that's the ASX. It's the monopoly that controls our exchange. They are moving to blockchain for all of their settlements. They are harnessing it, and you know it's hard to see who can compete with the ASX domestically. All right. Uh, I have been honored to talk to you for roughly an hour. I would love to answer any questions. M uh, nibbles and mingling and drinking will now begin. Uh, but if anyone wants to say anything to me with a public audience, now is your big opportunity. Hello, sir. I don't know if this is insider trading. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> you recommended earlier uh, investing in a lot of blockchain startups. Yeah, look, great question. So first of all, and uh, if there's any lawyers present, uh, I would hate to think anyone's recommended anything. I have merely illuminated, but uh, and that's just a technical thing. Um, blockchain as a technology is fascinating. Now, if you look at the dot-com boom, if you even go back in time to the railways boom back in industrial, Lancastrian United Kingdom, many of those businesses failed even though the underlying story was fascinating, that the premise was very strong, but you still need a management team to borrow effectively and run the entity. So I think most blockchain startups will probably have some sort of messy ending. But in there will be one or two that will be acquired by major financial institutions. They will have something wonderful to bring to market and they will be that pride of place in your portfolio that you pick them up young. Uh, I think too much is still to go in terms of water under the bridge, tell you which that will be. But there is big opportunity. I personally don't, no. Um, again, uh, there's lots of different, uh, so for the, everyone that's aware, once you've mined your coin and you hold them, you've got to put them somewhere and uh, they will also need to be secure. So there are different wallets. I think again, it's an emergent market. But, uh, you know, let's have a beer in a second and, uh, you know, who knows? There might be smarter ideas in your mind. Yeah, three, <laughs> three beers. I'm sold. Uh, it's been an honor to talk to you for so long. It's been an honor, really, to showcase what lies ahead this year. It won't be decided in this room, but if we can capitalize on little ideas. I would like to say that thanks to Michael's charm and this wonderful room, this is a very interesting and fascinating and talented collection of people. And were you to come away from tonight with a future partner, a future investor, a future friend, then that's an equally good investment of an hour of your time. So I'd welcome the chance to meet as many of you as possible. You won't want to talk to me, but you might want to talk to each other. Uh, canapes are on their way. And on behalf of all of the team here, thank you very much for attending what I hope was an interesting hour.